Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the Tech Talks. We are very excited to have Jessica and Courtney here with us today. And before we start, um, I'd like to acknowledge all Alaska Native nations today, and especially um, their role as sovereign nations here in the state and elsewhere. And I would like to acknowledge that we are, well, we're um, the campus is on Trathida, so which is on the unceded lands of the lower Tenana Dene. Um, and um, yeah, very excited um, to see everyone here today. I'll pass it over to Margaret, who's going to do the introductions. And um, yeah, with that, thanks for joining. Yeah, um, thanks. So, you know, we did kind of have this envision to have this very geoscience centered, but I thought the work that just Dr. Jessica Black does and Courtney Carruthers, um, Dr. Jessica Black is from Alaska Native Studies, Tribal Governance and Rural Development, and Courtney Carruthers is from the College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences, and they just do great work as far as community driven community based research, and I thought that would be a great example. Um, for geosciences to learn as well as I know we've been getting a very diverse audience as well. And so um, I'd like to welcome them and thank them for presenting at Tech Talks. Yes, Masicho, Shalok Naim. Thank you, my relatives. Uh, we'll go ahead and pull up our uh, talk today. So yeah, Dring Gwinzi, good afternoon, everyone. Shojri Jessica Oji Gutchajre Gwatsan Ithli Gatanan Gwichi. My name is Jessica Black. My family is from the village of Fort Yukon, Gwichaje. Right behind me in my picture is our fish camp on the Yukon River. And I also grew up in Tagatili, Ninana, just down the highway. And I'd like to say that I am privileged and honored to work on the traditional homelands of the Chena Huthtani, the Lower Tanana Dene, and want to thank them for their past, present, and future stewardship of these beautiful lands. It's such an honor to be in this space with you all. Um, the title of our talk this afternoon is indigenizing and decolonizing fisheries and marine sciences in Alaska. And I'm honored to be co-presenting with two of my colleagues, Dr. Courtney Carruthers and Janessa Esquible. Um, and I will turn it over to them to introduce themselves. Um, in these pictures, the one on the, if you're facing the screen on the left, I'm checking the net um at our fish camp on the Yukon River and I chose this picture <clears throat> because we my family have been fishing for generations you know thousands of years living in relationship with our land waters animals and plant relatives and this picture re just really means a lot to me because I'm carrying on something that was passed down from my grandparents and parents and they're passed down from their parents and so on. So this picture is just more than a picture to me. It really embodies a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today. So thank you. And I will turn it over to Dr. Carruthers to introduce herself. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, I'm Courtney Carruthers. Um, I'm a professor of fisheries as Margaret said. I've got pictured here my two daughters, um, Sola, who's seven, and Annika, who's five. They just had birthdays this past week. So a shout out to all the parents of little kids who feel like you're losing your mind, because I'm certainly <laughs> right there with you. Um, but we are settlers here in Denina lands in Anchorage. My family comes from Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. We have multi-generational roots there. Um, and ancestry back to Ireland and England, although I didn't really grow up learning much about my ancestors. Um, but growing up in Pittsburgh, I was surrounded by the sort of early capitalism of our country, the Carnegie's, the Mellons, like all of these huge estates and lots of wealth and a, a really deep labor history where my steel, steel mill working family, you know, was, was living that labor history, trying to fight for worker rights, um, seeing my uncles in the 70s and 80s not being able to find jobs when all the mills shut down. And so I sort of like grew up in this very class centered um, lifestyle and reflection. I, I wore a really big chip on my shoulder in college because 
I didn't come from an educated family. I didn't come from wealth and just had this real kind of focus on like, man, you know, so many people don't have much in this world. But as I started to learn more about um, the history of where I'm from and, and the native peoples of that place and the African-American history of that place, I started to really understand I as a white person had so much to learn about racial equity in our country as well. And um, I'm learning that, that history now, you know, in my 30s and 40s uh, and really trying to bring up my girls um, with a, a real history of the place they're growing up, a real history of their, where they come from, what's the, the sort of lineage that we're part of. Um, so anyway, I um, uh, came to Alaska for the first time uh, in 2002. I was invited to live in the village of Old Harbor in Kodiak, Alaska to do my PhD work. And that was a really transformational experience where I learned really deep connection that people have with their fisheries, with their land, with their animals, Sukpiak peoples. Again, this dispossessing history as well though, the, the fight that they have against privatization of their access rights, erasure of their history and people from, from education, from research, from governance. And so really trying to um, direct my research as, a, as an anthropologist, a fishery social scientist toward understanding issues of equity and access in how we educate um, students about fisheries, how we do research about fisheries, and how we govern fisheries and really trying to direct toward some pretty big shifts in all of those systems. So thank you so much for inviting us, uh, Margaret and Annika, and I'll pass to Janessa Esquible and really want to acknowledge Janessa. We invited her to join us um, just last week and she was really gracious to do that and has some really amazing work going on in the Cuscoquam River. And we're so gr grateful to have you, Janessa. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, um, miigwech everyone. And thanks again, uh, Courtney and Jessica for having me join you today and everyone. Um, so Anin everyone, Adishnakaj Janessa, Nindojaba Detroit, Ajijak Nindodim. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Janessa Skible and I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan, home to the Potawatomi and Ojibwe peoples. And I belong to the Crane clan. And my family comes from uh, Guanajuato, Mexico, which is in central Mexico, and also Bequezonang territory, which refers to the place where the waters divide right at the, the mouth of the St. Clair River. And I currently reside and work on the ancestral homelands of the Yupik and Chupik people here in Bethel, Mumtagithluk, Alaska. And I've been here for about five years now. And I chose this picture of me on the right. This was from the this past summer. And I just feel really grateful to work here. I work for a Rootsagakumut Native Council, the, the tribal governing body for Bethel. And I've really made some great friends like family since moving here. And this summer, uh, some of my friends taught me how to make strips for the first time. And our friend helped us build a drying rack. So just really grateful to be here. And I've learned so much um, from living, living and working here. Thank you. Thank you for those introductions. So yeah, I wanna just acknowledge this beautiful map from the Alaska Native Language Center. And it's uh, periodically updated. So you can actually buy this in print um, and hang it in your, your office or in your classrooms. But we want to just draw your attention to the diversity of languages spoken here in Alaska, but also, the many tribal communities that exist across the state, over 200 federally recognized tribes. And um, while there are language groups like Gwich'in, there's a lot of diversity within our Gwich'in culture. And the same is true for all of the language families and the different communities. And so when we're talking about decolonizing and indigenizing, we also recognize that a lot of this work um, can only be done in partnership and close working relationship with the communities, the peoples and the cultures and uh, of this place. And so we wanted to just draw your attention to this um, map. And I also wanted to say is that growing up in Alaska, in my family, I didn't come to my education um, without knowledge as a blank slate. I came to elementary school very versed in my family's culture, which was were fishermen, but also 
My grandparents were Gwich'in speakers. We lived with them. I also had the honor of being cared for by a um, Lower Tanana Dana elder when I was a little girl. So I came to school with an immense amount of knowledge and that knowledge just grew over time as one um, would learn in school, but just within my family, community, and my culture. You can get the next slide, please. So in this place, Alaska, we have 14,000 plus years of indigenous stewardship and care. It's interesting because when I'm talking with some people, you know, they there there's questions of, well, how do you, how do you know that you've been here this long. Well, now there's just so much evidence, like archeological evidence. And I also know from just the stories that are passed down to me from my elders and my family and our traditional knowledge keepers. Yet that knowledge of stewardship and care and also knowledge about many things has um, really been erased from mainstream education. I. You know, I mentioned that growing up, I was versed in many things and I felt like my grandparents were just experts on the land and we were taught how to, you know, read the water and care for the, the earth and the animals and that the water had a spirit. Um, but those knowledge systems hadn't ever really been brought into mainstream education. Now in elementary school, I had some bilingual classes, but it was like once a week for an hour or you know, maybe a couple times a week and we had an elder come in and teach us. But at home and within the community, it was always present, just not within the mainstream education system. And then I always tell a story and maybe some of you have heard it before if you've been to any of my other talks, but I was in a class when I was in my undergraduate um, education here at UAF and we had to read about colonization of our Alaska Native people. And just uh, one of the examples was the boarding school experience that many of our Native elders went through. And I just remember leaving the class felt like, feeling like I was slapped in the face because a lot of that information was never really presented to me in my life. And yet it made so much sense regarding what happened with my people and the ongoing effect exclusion and deep inequities is ever present, but it's not necessarily taught. And so um, I became very passionate about change. I have my background in social work and community organizing and advocacy. Um, striving for equity is very much aligned with social work values. So I've really worked um, to shift education, research and governance systems to center indigenous people and our self-determination and knowledge systems. Um, I mentioned that there's over 200 federally recognized tribes in the state of Alaska, and we have a government to government relationship with the US federal government. And that's based on federal Indian law and a long history um, there. So I've really focused my work on um, not only bringing forth some of these inequities, but shifting education to be more responsive to include indigenous knowledge in our education system to honor the all that is embodied in this place. So we know that there's indigenous people, but there's also this beautiful land and environment that has taught me so much as an indigenous person. So this uh, definition of indigenous knowledge, I won't read it, um, but Margaret, you have access to our slides and you can share them. But I have been fortunate enough to read through a lot of the uh, scholarship in did by both indigenous and non indigenous scholars working in indigenous contexts. And there's a lot of definitions of indigenous knowledge. And um, after reading through the scholarship, I came up with a definition that I felt really fit what I was feeling as far as what is indigenous knowledge. And I think what I'll draw your attention to are two aspects. Um, one, that is very much centered on spirituality, which is very different than maybe Western academic uh, institutions where we don't really talk about spirituality 
in our work, um, but it's very much at the heart of Indigenous knowledge. And then also that Indigenous knowledge um, stems from Indigenous epistemologies, how we come to know, and that stems from experience in place, like out on the land. So I think those are things to really remember because when we try to um, put in a box what is Indigenous knowledge or how do you measurement or how do you translate that can be very difficult for a person like me who has been educated in place based on my Indigenous epistemologies and centered on spirituality. So next slide, please. So we recognize as scholars working together that there are there is this plurality in of worldviews. And for example, <clears throat> in the indigenous worldview, um, the spirit of all things. And so I had mentioned water, plant, animal relatives who have agency and who I live in relationship with, not in a hierarchical sense, but equitably. And so um, I know that because of my time on the land and recognizing what's happening around me and that, um, you know, sometimes that's very hard to talk about in a Western academic institution because there is more knowledge special specialization or separation of nature and culture or this, um, you know, uh, how, how should I say it, just not wanting to talk about spirituality or the spirit of all things. Um, indigenous knowledge is very cyclical and circular. I always tell the story that, you know, my elders teach me through stories, but they don't end the story with this is the lesson. That lesson is for me to come to understand and figure out based on my time on the land, on my spiritual connection to place. Um, and that's very different, right, than than you know some western worldviews where it's very lin linear and um, we are looking for like cause and effect in this linear linear direction so building on the scholarship of little little bear um, gadamus raymond Jacobian, and then work of the council of athabascan tribal governments just coming to understand that there are these pluralism plurality of worldviews and that's okay. In fact, it's a good thing. It can only enhance the way that education is provided to our students, but also um, how research is conducted and done as we seek to decolonize. Next slide. So we're really fortunate as a team to um, build off some of the projects we've been working on, including indigenous indigenizing salmon management Science and, science and management in Alaska. And then more recently, we were awarded some funding through the National Science Foundation for a project called Damamta, which uh, Dr. Crothers will speak about later. But we have been um, very fortunate in that we have been advised and mentored by a group of scholars, indigenous and non-indigenous who are doing work in this area of decolonization and indigenizing and a lot of elders and community leaders who have really directed this work. We started working together in a project called the State of Alaska Salmon and People, which has since uh, closed out, but we were able to gather quite a few times together and document a lot of knowledge, but also uh, collect a lot of data that has really informed our work. Next slide. And one of those projects is indigenizing science and, science and management in Alaska. And really the goal of this project is to document the breadth and depth of indigenous values, knowledge and governance systems connected to salmon across Alaska and improve the systems for the betterment of all. It's been, um, I always call it the joy in my life um, to wake up and do this type of work is really inspirational to me. I feel like it's coming full circle, starting where I came from with my grandparents. So um, we're, this is a statewide project and it's ongoing. Next slide, please. These are the guiding questions that the Indigenizing Salmon Management Project looks at. And um, so there's these conceptual questions 
but also um, taking a critical look at the current system and documenting where there are challenges and then looking at what could be and how we could in better include Indigenous knowledge and values to improve the system overall. Next slide. And um, the methodology is what's really exciting because remember I said a lot of Indigenous methodologies are based on Indigenous epistemo epistemology. So how we come to know, right? And so how I came to know is through the teachings of my parents and my grandparents and then my Western education. So our methodology though, within the indigenizing science and management system is um, indigenous led. So I'm the PI on the project, but we also have uh, Dr. Crothers, Dr. Donker Sloot, and we have uh, partners from all across Alaska who are, in their communities, they're running organizations, they're doing this type of work anyways, and they're indigenous people um, and they know their communities. So we are building, building and strengthening ethical relationships um, connected to local priorities. And we have a lot of students on the project who are from the different regions and are co-leading these projects. Um, one thing I'll add that's not on there is also just um, reflexivity. So looking at our own internal processes and how we're leading the work and being reflexive and making sure that we're aligning with um, indigenous values and you know things like reciprocity and respect. Uh, and how we go about doing this is through circle dialogues where everybody gets to have a chance to speak to a topic and um, everyone else is listening. And then we follow a set of values that are put forth by First Alaskans Institute. We also have multi-generational interviews, which Janessa will talk a little bit more about. And then cultural exchange and deep learning. So going, when invited, when invited, going into a place and actually just spending time with indigenous people, scholars, elders in their home and just listening, learning, and uh, observing life as it happens and some of the challenges, but also the strengths. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Crothers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Black. Yes, so one of our, our major methods here, and I, I think a really rich source of, of learning for our project are these racial equity dialogues. And we have a, yeah, a big debt of gratitude to First Alaskans Institute who, spent several days training us, our team, on how to conduct um, these difficult dialogues. Many of you might have um, been part of their and or process, the Alaska Native Dialogues on Racial Equity that they've hosted across the state in many different um, realms and are continuing that work in, in some transformational racial healing work. Um, we start in our work from a place that these racial inequities exist. We don't go to try to prove them. As, as Dr. Black has said, Alaska Native people are living these inequities. We study them in our research program and you know, from the criminalization of traditional fisheries, the alienation of Alaska Native fishing rights, the marginalization of tribes and, and, and communities and indigenous values and ways of knowing from our management processes. We, we start from a place of, of recognizing that this is the truth and this is the way things are. And we're trying to share experiences across our cultures, across our life experiences to come to have everyone share that knowledge and, and to share that, that truth. And so rather than you know, putting up a PowerPoint of here's all the things you should know, we sit in circle with each other. Everyone is equals with really nice values about how we'll have a hard conversation and we learn and we exchange and we do a lot of deep work internally within our, you know, for me as a settler scholar, there's a lot of processing and, and visiting that I do um, with other uh, non-Native people who are, who are here trying to commit to doing uh, better work for the future. I think we've already made a lot of progress. I wanted to share just a short story from one of our first um, Salmon and Society conferences that we hosted in collaboration with First Alaskans Institute for the Racial Equity Work. I think it was back in 2016 or 2015. We had um, proposed in our agenda to have a dialogue on racial equity and our agenda was changed and it just said dialogue. Um, and so I said, well, what, you know, what's the deal? Like why, why is the racial equity 
you know, out of that, <laughs> out of our title. And the sense was it was uncomfortable. It was too, it was too uncomfortable to, to print the word racial um, in this salmon meeting um, agenda. We pushed back on that. The, the pushback was also, well, if the Alaska Native, this is like sort of a quote, uh, if the Alaska Native participants want to have a dialogue on equity, we can host that like in a separate room. And, and the idea, if there's issues with racial equity, it involves Native people, not non-Native people. So again, we, we sort of pushed back on that. Uh, another thing I'm remembering is, is somebody mentioning, well, we have an equality clause in our state constitution, so I don't understand what you're talking about equity. Like the idea that, that again, these were from white um, non-native um, viewpoints, the idea that these equity issues are, are lived and experienced, um, but not, not for some of us. And so this, I think, highlighted the, the really important need for doing this work collectively um, and in a real way. So, so the progress, I think in the sense of, of there's not that same resistance that there was five years ago to even having a conversation around racial equity in fisheries. So, um, and I think the, um, what's being, we've hosted these racial equity dialogues across the state. We've hosted them also in academic conferences and it's such an amazing transition. This is a, a look at a um, circle dialogue we hosted at a, an applied anthropology meeting. Many of you are used to conferences, you get your 15 minutes, you give your talk, you know, you might get a couple questions and, and maybe you visit with people in the off space, but to create a circle in a conference hall and have everyone sit looking at each other, introducing themselves, talking together as a collective, learning, exchanging, it's transformational, just that act of making a circle. And the resistance to it, you know, again, in the science and society meeting, we were trying to make a a circle in one of the rooms and there you can't do that what are you doing you can't do that like no no we are doing this this we're in a circle if you don't want to join feel free to leave you know we're doing this this is what we're doing and so i think these little small things can be really transformational um so yeah and, and one more thing to share on this before i pass to janessa um some of the sh the stories that are shared as part of these dialogues i think lead to so much learning and transformation. And a couple of examples that I'll speak to at the end as well. Um, Atna Elder Wilson Justin, with his permission, um, sh sharing, we, we did an interview as well as uh, many dialogues that he participated in, sharing from an Atna perspective how common sense concepts in Western fishery science like maximum sustainable yield or the, the tragedy of the commons, this idea that fundamentally human beings are competitive they act as individuals, they will take what they, they, they will accumulate rather than share. These are European norms. These are European values that Western society has made universal. They're meant to apply to everyone and they don't apply to everybody. There are cultures, you know, living cultures in our state that are based on reciprocity and sharing that are not based on competition. And we've erased them from our fisheries learning. And so, that, that's part of the, 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 the sort of hearing um, through story, how some of these key common sense concepts in a Western framework are so offensive from Manatna or another indigenous culture framework. We're trying to bring all of that together in the same space so we can really understand this, this pluralism that Dr. Black was talking about. So, um, Janessa, I, I, one of our other major methods um, that we've been hosting um, as part of um, our Indigenizing Salmon Management Project is, is multi-generational interviews. I also want to acknowledge this was a shift in methodology um, in the Western social sciences. We often do inter individual interviews and we were given suggestion by um, indigenous leaders in our work that it'd be really much better to host multi-generational interviews with families, with um, youth and, and young people doing these interviews in their home communities with their families. So we've been doing these about 75 so far across the state um, around common questions about salmon and salmon stewardship, learning to care for salmon. Um, these, what, what, we, what people wish that Western scientists and managers knew about their relationships with salmon. And Janessa has been leading work um, in the Kuskokwim region and really wanted, we really wanted to highlight that work. Um, and so we'll um, pass to you at this point, Janessa, thank you. Thanks, Courtney. So this was one of the, this is a picture here that was taken back in the fall of 2018. And this was from one of the first ISM dialogues that was hosted in Bethel. And 
Courtney Carruthers, Jessica Black, and Jonathan Samuelson, they, they came out to Bethel and they, they held a dialogue between ONC Council subsistence committee members. And we also had the Cuscoquim River Intertribal Fish Commission. There was some really powerful sharing that happened in this space during the couple of days that we, we were together. And this really helped to further guide the work that we ended up doing along the Cuscoquim. We can move to the next slide. So before I get into project progress, here are a couple, ex uh, a couple additional photos of families. On the left here, we have the Hoffman family, and on the right, the Whitworth Andrews family, so from Bethel on the left and on the right in McGrath. And we had the honor of sharing time and um, a space with this, these multi-fishing, uh, multi-generational fishing families, and it was really amazing um, to spend time with them and, and several other families throughout this work. And so, so far, Along the Kuskokwim, 14 interviews have been conducted, uh, including about 27 individuals and across four different communities representing the Coastal, Lower River, and the Headwater region, as well as both Yupik and, and Athabascan knowledge and value systems. And in this work, we've also involved Alaska Native Science and Engineering program interns from the region. We've involved Yupik High School and undergraduate youth in this project. And they've helped with uh, conducting the and transcribing the interviews. And I just really want to thank them. There's an ANSEP intern here in the, the middle, Destiny Ropati, um, who's from Bethel. And she's like in the center here in the Hoffman family photo. And it's just been really great to have youth as a part of this work, bring them in. Um, they also have a lot of really incredible insight and have made great contributions to this project. And we can go to the next slide. So for the next couple of slides, I wanted to share some of the emerging themes just from a few of the project interviews. And I, I really liked how Dr. Black framed it the other day and that we're, we're just messengers of this knowledge. And so I'm really grateful to be here and just to provide you with some of what's been shared with us along the Kuskokwim and through this work. And so the first slide I wanted to share is centered around indigenous stewardship practices and values. So many families shared the importance of the first catch always going to elders, disabled, widows, or those in need. Another elder emphasized um, the importance of processing the food right away. And here's a quote from her on the, the right here. My mom taught me really young how to care of, for food on hand right away, like seal, furs, salmon, anything. She taught me a lot, but now I teach my grandkids, even when they're young, how to cut fish and work on seal. And so this quote, not only emphasizes the importance of taking care of your food right away but, and knowing how to do this, but also the importance of passing this knowledge and wisdom on to the younger, younger generations. No waste, um, no catch and release was also another indigenous stewardship practice and value where once the fish offer themselves to you, um, you should never release it back into the water. That came out in several interviews and respect as a core value. And this quote was provided by an interviewee where she was on a boat fishing and a couple people that she was with started to bicker a bit and she said, shh, the fish are going to hear you. And so this um, just really emphasizes the importance of respect and being aware of how you speak and how you go about yourself when you're on the lands and waters around the fish and the animals and the importance of, of maintaining and being in good relations with the fish um, and treating each other with respect. And then this last quote here from a group of elders is that we aren't supposed to sell anything that God gives us from the land, river, or the ocean. And this kind of ties in with some of the concerns that were brought up around the um, commercial high seas fisheries. Next slide. So a lot of the observations that were shared in these interviews were around changing size and quality of fish, the abundance of fish. So far from the interview transcripts that we've reviewed, all of the families have expressed concerns about the smaller sizes of the fish, the decline in fish abundance, as well as the changing quality in the fish, where they're, they're noticing that the flesh isn't as firm as it used to be, Parasites, different diseases are more common nowadays than, than they've ever observed. A concern about climate change um, was brought up in several interviews and the unknown impacts to salmon from a warming ocean. There was also a connection made between 
the warming climates and this increase um, and expansion of an invasive plants in some communities, as well as uh, concerns about salmon habitat, other fish habitat. And that's kind of captured here in the quote on the right. And Athabascan elders shared, I didn't get any silvers because these places where I was fishing before. There are creeks that I fished for silvers before while well, they're dying. The water is not clear water like it used to be. It's dead waters. It's brown, ugly water. The fish were sad and weak. Next slide. And then the last theme that I'll touch on today is around Western management practices. There was an obvious need and just a, a desire for increased tribal involvement in decision-making processes. It was made pretty clear across all the generations of people that, that we spent time with who grew up on the land and al along the river have a really deep, intimate understanding of the fishery and should really have a more active role and say in fisheries management beyond just an advisory capacity. There was a clear need for relationship building. Um, I think relation building is, is really gonna be critical to improve management practices in the future. And there were a lot of feelings of distrust that came up in the different interviews. Um, one interview he shared that they're out of touch with what we need, mainly attributing this to the fact that oftentimes people don't even know the fisheries managers, let alone have any, um, if at all, face-to-face -face interaction with them. Oftentimes here, the state managers are in a community for a summer, um, and it's, it's really not enough time to build real relationships with people and to really gain a better understanding of the challenges, concerns, and needs of communities along the Kuskokwim, some of which I spoke to today, but many of which I won't have time to get to. But that in order to really understand them, you, you need to spend time in these communities and with these people. There was a, also some conflict with traditional timing of the fishing and restrictions in recent years where the fisheries closed during some of the best drying um, weather of the season. And from what was shared in the interviews, it's, it's affecting lower river communities, but it's, it's also affecting some of the, the coastal communities who experience more humid weather and they, they find themselves trying to put up fish in some of the rainier seasons and it's really difficult to avoid spoilage and waste. Um, and so, so that was also a, another concern. And then the last point here, but also really important is the fact that there's really no value placed on spirituality and management. Um, the majority of, of interviews that we've, we've seen so far shared that UPIC values are not reflected in the current fisheries management processes. And an interview expressed concern about there being no value placed in spirituality in these different management arenas. And that this is really problematic, especially when, um, as the interviewee shared with us, the biggest part of subsistence is spirituality. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to Courtney. Yeah, thanks so much, Janessa. And, and we're, um, as I mentioned, this is, a, or as we mentioned, this is a statewide pro project and we're having um, similar interviews in regions across the state and find really deeply held values around salmon that are persistent and deeply held still, um, the sense that salmon are, are sentient beings, they have agency, they're in control. There's a lot of respect um, needed between people and between people and salmon. There's this moral obligation to maintain respectful relations, um, these shared values that Janessa was speaking to around not wasting, um, how equity, dis distributional equity, um, elders first, those in need first, uh, making sure everything is fair, that, that there's not an accumulation uh, in an unfair way, those are all center, central um, in these indigenous systems. And of course, the teaching and, and practicing of these important relations with salmon. And of course, um, this is another, I, I think, thing I reflect a lot about in our Western fisheries realm, that the deep knowledge that indigenous people have with their lands and waters and fish, of course, um, is central. And, and we um, have not acknowledged that well in Western science um, to date. Um, some of the um, some of the um, previous uh, research and work and, and our current project is helping to document um, some of these um, stewardship practices, indigenous stewardship practices. And here's a picture of um, one of our uh, partners in this work, Brooke Woods um, on the Yukon River and um, you know, living a, a subsistence and salmon-based way of life. 
Um, but a lot of these, um, again, uh, stewardship and governance mechanisms, practices, values, um, spiritual dimensions that affect how people are and, and relate to fish and other things, these, these haven't been visible in the Western system. And um, that, that's part of our, uh, one of the goals of our work is to help with that visibility to, to show Western managers that indigenous people are managing their resource, have been and, and should continue doing so um, on their own terms. I wanted to briefly, I, we wanna make sure we leave time for questions, but wanted to briefly introduce a new project. We did a webinar um, last week on a new project, Damumta which we have a website, demumta.org, that will have a recording of that if you're interested in learning more about this new initiative funded through NSF, National Science Foundation, focused on graduate education and really transforming how we teach about and, and know about fisheries in, in marine sciences um, in Alaska and beyond. So we have this major goal focused on graduate education and, and a very, um, uh, sort of uh, well-mentored uh, program for indigenous students and allied students to get their graduate degrees in fisheries and marine sciences, but also to really reach across the university and all of our partner organizations, tribal partners, state partners, federal partners, to bring some of the indigenizing and decolonizing work into their organizations and agencies and in their work. So we're really excited about this project. Um, we're recruiting for a first cohort of graduate students to start in this fall, fall 2021, and our applications are open and they're due February 15th. We have a lot of exciting new classes, um, elders and in residents, indigenous scholars will be visiting, um, hosting some of these racial equity dialogues within our college um, of fisheries and ocean sciences, but across the whole UAF and UA campus. If you're interested in those, there'll be lots of opportunities to get involved. Um, working with Yupik artist Abayuk Moore on representing indigenous relations with salmon and, and fish in our, in our artwork and our buildings and, and on our website, we're so excited for that work. Doing some deep work in community, fish camp and cultural exchanges, villages and um, camps that might welcome us to, to, to to go to learn as, as students and, and others uh, committed to doing this work. So we wanted to end, um, I believe this is our last slide. We wanted to end with um, a few points of reflection because we've been working um, indigenous and settler scientists together and we've been doing this for a few years. We had some reflections that we thought might be useful for some of you no matter what stage you might be at thinking about doing some of this work or doing it. And so Dr. Black will lead us off with our, our first few uh, reflections and then we'll wrap up after that. Yeah, thank you, Courtney. And thank you, Janessa, for your uh, just time and all your expertise. So one of the things I think that's just very important is recognizing tribal sovereignty. Uh, a lot of my colleagues who might be entering into the world of research with indigenous communities will ask me like what's a good way to start or you know i've gotten um i'm going for irb approval and i i'm starting to build a relationship with a community and i'll always say it's really good to approach the tribe and let them know that you're what you're doing because while they might not have their own formal irb they are the tribal government and they will have great suggestions for your work and also you want their support so that you can um, you know, know that your work is, is being approved by tribal leadership and they're giving you their blessing or they're asking you to make some changes. And so reaching out to these tribal sovereigns and getting on their next meeting agenda, presenting in front of them, getting feedback, um, going back to the drawing board if you need to, but recognizing that strong governing system that exists. As I mentioned, spirituality, it's at the core of indigenous knowledge and methodologies. It's, it is what makes, you know, it's so, for me, it's, it's everything, spiritual, spirituality, my relationship with the land, the animals who give themselves to to us, um, the the water, the the plants, and and you know when you're out on the land, um, this spiritual relationship that exists. Um, more indigenous faculty and staff. I think that as we start moving into the area of decolonizing and indigenizing, because indigenous knowledge stems from indigenous epistem 
epistemologies, how we come to know, we need more indigenous faculty and staff to help um, well, engage in these conversations, lead these conversations, uh, share what they know, um, and then creating safe spaces. And I even put indigenous only spaces because what happens is in a lot of environments, indigenous students and faculty and staff have to do a lot of the education, educating around indigenous knowledge and values and that um, can be a huge burden in many ways of always having to do that. So these safe spaces where Indigenous scholars can gather and share and reflect is really important so that when they enter these other spaces that they have um, the support and the, and the good feelings of going forward um, in a good way and that they have that safe place to go back to. Courtney? Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, and so so some of these reflections here toward the end, um, thinking, you know, and maybe directing this more towards the settler scholars and students that might be interested in some of this work, sort of doing some reflection on some of the ways that the, this Eurocentrism and, and institutional racism is, is sometimes really invisible. Um, I gave that example of, of concepts around maximum sustainable yield or, or these these sort of the, the way in which Western science tends to universalize um, human behavior or human goals, these sorts of things, recognizing that pluralism, recognizing when you're trying to make a hierarchy, like is, is this, this Western science is the gold standard, we, we know that, or, or is it? Is there another knowledge system that's actually more, more pertinent, more, more knowledgeable? How can we come to understand letting go of some of that um, baggage of, of colonialism and, and really um, it's it's deep work, it's hard work. Um, I think a lot of us are, are doing anti-racism training and work and doing some deep reflection, continuing to do that work, trying not to burden um, indigenous students and, and faculty with that learning that, that you, know, you, you could be doing or should be doing um, and so just, leaning into that, being able to, you know, make mistakes, reflecting on who you're accountable to in your research and your work. Um, there's a lot of indigenous scholarship that, that we reference in our work. I, I'm thinking of Margaret Kovach um, as one of many, um, has a really nice reflection, a whole chapter on indigenous uh, and non-indigenous uh, relations, the roles in research. So, one of the things that stuck with me is, is a reflection from her about are, are you as a as a as a settler scholar, you know, am I taking up space or am I making space? How is what I'm doing, yeah, kind of amplifying or 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 centering myself in a bad way? All of these kind of reflections, I think it's really important. And um, I'm by no means an expert in any of this. I'm just trying to continue to educate myself and, and do better work moving forward. Uh, the, the small steps, big transformations, I mentioned the circle can be such a big um, step. Um, but, you know, these small steps, you might look at a syllabus, you've been teaching a class, and you might look at your syllabus, how can I decolonize and indigenize this syllabus a little bit? How can I, um, you know, start to read a bit, you know, on, on my own? What the, um, Margaret shared podcasts and different um, references and some of the other speakers in the series I, I think have shared things so just you know starting starting small and and um, being afraid not not afraid <laughs> being not afraid and and reaching out um, if you need some help maybe to the some of the allied people in this work as well and I think uh, yeah we wanted to say um, Guyana Masicho thank you to uh, our funders NSF has been funding several of our projects and we're working in close collaboration with um, tribes and indigenous organizations, as well as um, NOAA Fisheries is partnering with us on Demumpta, and I, I believe the state Alaska Department of Fish and Game will as well. Um, so we're really excited about this work and thank you so much. And yeah, thanks very much for all three of you for your insight and for sharing with us. Um, that's been it's been a great talk and I would like to open it up for questions. We have um, a couple of questions in the chat um, that I'm seeing, but um, also if you wanna raise your hand um, or speak up um, and unmute yourself after your questions, um, you're most welcome to do so. Um, otherwise, um, we got a question and now 
um, from uh, Karen. And she said, um, this has been great. Thank you for sharing. Have you worked with fish managers at Alaska Fishing Game, ADF G Alaska Fishing Game to educate them about these inclusive practices and acknowledging indigenous knowledge. How can we get them to follow these practices you're talking about? Thank you, Annika and Karen for the question. I'll start and if anyone wants to chime in, but yes, we are, we're, we're definitely um, building relationship and um, have been part of um, some collective work. Um, the Alaska Salmon Fellows program comes to mind as a, an effort that tried to bring together um, salmon people across the state and there was participation um, with a member of the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and, and we've been building relations and, and kind of building out from there and, and thinking about the best way to, um, to, to proceed. We have some colleagues in the social sciences as well that have been part of our state of Alaska salmon and people and also the natural sciences. So we, we definitely have relations in our work and I think we're seeing um, a lot of um, entry points and some of the work that we're doing in Tamumta, we're developing some short courses and some engagement that would be targeted for Alaska Department of Fish and Game, for example, um, kind of continuing education classes, ways that we might be able to um, link interns to be able to work at Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And so then um, indigenous students might be helping to bring some of those knowledge systems into the agency. So yes, it's definitely on our, um, our mind of how to best do that. And we are starting and we're hoping to grow that, um, grow that out. Yeah, I was just gonna add that, you know, we have, colleagues that we've worked with who work at the department and who have been part of our dialogues and conversations and I feel like um you know really value appreciate indigenous knowledge and have written some about it and then you know we're also like Courtney said really working to strengthen those relationships and um and reach out and also through our students' experiences like the internship. So just kind of, you know, emphasizing what Courtney says, we are doing what we can to build those and strengthen those relationships. And we'll also have like visiting scholar talks, which we will be sharing that information more widely um, with the community. So not just like the UAF community, but um, management. And, uh, you know, for example, we went to a really transformative talk um, I don't know if they were at the University, University of British Columbia, but they did this, uh, it's called um, Two-Eyed Seeing. Yeah, and, and, and their work is just really amazing. It really talk, it talks about, you know, indigenous knowledge in Western science. And then and it just really gets in depth. And, um, you know, it'd be fabulous to have those scholars come talk at UAF, but that's the type of work we hope to do and really engage the community more, more widely. So um, it is one of our goals, both in indigenizing salmon management and the Mumta. So. There was a question about resources. Um, we do have a annotated bibliography that's being, um, I should say cleaned up and just, uh, we had so many sources. So uh, some of our students, but also our, um, we have a really amazing colleague, Danielle Ringer, who has helped lead that work. And she um, is helping some of the students like clean up that annotated bibliography. So I'm not sure it's shareable at this point, but that's a resource that we're building for the larger community to, look at some of those readings and uh, see what's of interest so we could share that once it's finished. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, we'd be happy to um, share them on the Tech Talks website too, um, if you publish your, your talk there. So um, then we can double up. Um, we did have another question from David and this is how can we uh, what specific policies can we lobby to change at the various um, Alaska Fish and Game meetings? So maybe that's um, tying in with what you already said, but I'll pass it on to you. Yeah, I think like, um, I don't know about the lobbying part, but one thing 
we've because I'm also a faculty I'm a faculty member in Alaska Native Studies rural development but also tribal management which is now tribal governance and we have some classes where um, students testify at like the board of game board of fish and um, I think one thing that's just apparent to me is how accessible are these systems for people to come in and be part of decision making. I know, for example, like my family in Fort Yukon, which is just one flight away from Fairbanks, but if a meeting's in Fairbanks, you know, and they want to be present to testify, they have to fly in and like uh, get a hotel and then um, be up to speed on everything going on and testify. And those environments, like for me, just growing up in a small community, are they're just very intimidating. The whole process, you get the, like a few minutes in front of this body that <laughs> may or may not have been to your community um, and you have to testify within a certain amount of time. And so one thing I've already always thought about with equity is like, like making it accessible to people from all over because if that's the way we participate in the management or the governance of systems, is it equitable for everyone or is it just you know, if I live in Fairbanks, then I could just drive over to Pikes and testify, right? But if I don't, and I care, which, you know, all my people care about the fisheries, um, that's, that's a whole different situation. And so, um, you know, that's one thing is making systems equitable. And then even how um, decisions are made, um, and who represents indigenous people on these boards and um, like how they're appointed. So, I mean, I could get into a lot of depth here, but like right now I don't see it as an equitable system. I don't know. So. Yeah, just to add to a little bit of what Jessica said, I think even also just looking at the management frameworks that are currently being utilized by different management entities and you know, whether they're they're actually inclusive of indigenous traditional knowledge, or is it that much of just quantitative data is what guides and dictates most of management decisions. So asking those questions and looking at these management frameworks and seeing if they they really are um, inclusive and in allowing indigenous and traditional knowledge to, to guide, uh, more guide some of these decisions that are made. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing. I would like to highlight that in our chat, um, there's a mention of um, the regional advisory committee classes starting in February. Um, so maybe that's um, something to look into as well. Um, I'm really bad multitasking, but um, please check out the chat. Um, there's more information there on the on the topic. And um, just to follow up on that, a lot of those courses through tribal government stuff are usually short courses. And so even though the semester is already well in it, I think there's still classes you could probably still sign up for. And if you're looking for them, I think they're gonna be um, interior campus located, I think. Yeah, yeah uh, interior Alaska campus. And then there's, we have a tribal governance website too. Yeah. And we post flyers and whatnot on there. Um, and so I had a question and I know you're, work obviously crosses like the science and society boundary, but I often think a lot of people view geosciences as not as much strong relationship to society. And I was hoping you could speak on that and how you see your work kind of fitting into maybe geoscience research. I was gonna to punt to Janessa, you're closest to geosciences. I'm a, a social scientist through and through, um, but just to speak, if, if Dr. Seth Danielson doesn't mind me calling him out as an oceanographer, he's sort of close to geosciences, right? We've had some conversations with him about um, some of this kind of transformational work. And, and I think he's been, um, you know, le leading some thinking in this realm and, and maybe at the AGU, the Alaska Geophysical Union, right, around, um, bringing in indigenous knowledge into syllabuses that you're syllabi that you're teaching and but I, I also um, you know in conversations with with some of um, with those colleagues too, the sort of foundational like yeah equation based work and like the centering of, of those kind of quantitative understandings of, of you know how, how do you 
how do you disrupt some of the norms around like how you do modeling and, and, and mathematical simulations and things like that? That's a, an area I would love to hear more on. I don't have any expertise in it, but it does come up quite, quite a bit. Yeah, and I think just, you know, um, when we're talking about uh, methodologies and, you know, thinking about, um, you know, maybe somebody's like, I just study the ocean or I just study like something out in the ocean and, and they don't necessarily see the connection to like people in place. I, I try to explain like, even if you're not dealing directly with the community and you're just studying like the water, like for indigenous people, everything is connected. And so what, you know, what you're studying does ultimately impact people. So how can you do things in a good way and just keep that communication line open? Um, and again, like bringing uh, things into your syllabus that recognizes this long-term stewardship and the, just this different, the plurality of worldviews. So, you know, even if it's not what you do typically in your research that you're you're very focused on something, um, just bringing in the knowledge about like uh, relationality and the plurality of worldviews and that, you know, there's indigenous people in this place today and this is an indigenous place and just becoming more comfortable with that um, could really go a long way in extending um, better working relationships with indigenous people in this in this state and also um, moving forward and and really gathering just more holistic data that really helps you understand this very complex system that exists so that's just some thoughts that I have I just wanted to um, thank everybody who posed questions, comments, and your thoughts. Um, we th we're, This is ongoing work and uh, we've been speaking a lot more about it, but um, you know, this, this work takes a long time transformation. And so if you have more specific questions, feel free to email us. Um, I could put my email on the chat box. I'm also in the UAF directory, but there's a lot of ongoing projects at UAF I wanted to recognize that are doing a lot of this really uh, meaningful community-based transformative work. And we are partnering with as many of those projects as we can to help synergize. So um, within Damamta, we're partnering with One Health, um, who is uh, Arlie Reynolds, leads the One Health program. And um, like I said, I teach in tribal governance and we work very closely with our faculty in tribal governance who are working directly with communities and traditional knowledge experts. So I think that that's just one more thing I'd add to our reflection is that a lot of people um, are doing similar or aligned work. And as much as we can work together, I think that's where the transformation really happens. So I want to recognize all of you on this call that are doing that type of work. And we're happy to talk with you. Um, you know, this is this is a big effort. And so it takes all of us. Like Damamta, it means all of us in the Sukiak language. And so that's kind of how we view this work. Thank you. Um, and so it's four after, and I don't think we have any questions left. Um, we have a comment from Elizabeth. How and when respectful space and made in policy spaces is closely related to structures of visible and invisible racism in institutions, the state, the constitution, federal laws, and the individuals within them. And that's kind of what I was thinking a little bit with my question too, is I think there's a lot of unseen colonial practices, even within the geosciences. And I think Courtney was touching on that a little bit with how we model and things like that. Um, and I did put in the chat an evaluation form um, if participants could have a chance to fill it out. And I will post the recording later today when it's ready. And our next speaker next week is NSF program manager, Roberto Delgado. Um, he will talk about strengthening collaboration between Arctic researchers and Arctic residents. So, all right, thank you. I'm gonna stop the recording. See you. Bye. I'll, I'll hang out for a second. <laughs> <laughs>